Good morning. I'm Steve Rosansky, President and CEO of the Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce, and I want to welcome you to our May Government Affairs Committee meeting. Uh, unfortunately, Alberto uh, Sandoval, my uh, right hand on this show, is uh, on a plane as we speak up to Sacramento, making the case for UCI. So um, looks like you just have me this morning. Um, we've got a great guest uh, this morning, and uh, I think a very timely guest as we, uh, you know, listen to what uh, other uh, areas around us are doing about uh, the drought situation that we find ourselves in, things that the state may be doing um, to uh, you know, conserve water and uh, other mandates that we may be facing. So uh, I'm just going to kind of launch into it. At the end, we'll have uh, hopefully some uh, updates from legislative reps that uh, will join us uh, and give an update as to what's happening um, with their electeds in either um, Santa Ana or Sacramento. So here's, uh, Mark's already with us, so I'm just gonna embarrass him a little bit by reading his bio, if you don't mind, Mark. So Mark Vukovic was, or Mark, Mark V, as a lot of people call him, was named the Utilities Director for the City of Newport Beach in September, 2018. The utilities Department is responsible for the maintenance and operation of the city's water and wastewater systems, storm drain and tidal valve system, oil and gas operations and streetlights. Uh, you got a lot of, you wear a lot of hats there, Mark. Mm -hmm. Mark and his team also oversee the city's street sweeping and graffiti removal contractors. Mark has more than 20 years of experience in planning and engineering for utilities and public works departments. He initially joined the city in 2014 as the deputy public works director slash city engineer and oversaw the planning and design and construction of all public infrastructure projects. Before coming to Newport Beach, Mark served as the city engineer for the city of Anaheim. Prior to his tenure in Anaheim, he worked for the cities of Seal Beach and Claremont. Throughout Mark's career, he's concentrated on customer service, public outreach, and being highly responsive to the community. Mark holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Cal Poly Pomona. He's a licensed professional civil engineer and a general engineering contractor. Really, that's interesting. He previously served on the board of directors for the Southern California chapter of the American Public Works Association and as vice president of the Orange County City Engineers Association. Mark lives in Huntington Beach, uh, I think with four children, do you have Mark? How many children do you have? Five, six, oh my God, <laughs> you better keep your job. <laughs> you need the paycheck with all those kids. So uh, with that being said, I'm gonna, bow out here. Mark's got a great, uh, I already saw a little bit of his PowerPoint presentation and he's going to talk about that. He's also going to talk about another, maybe a little more uh, niche subject, but about restaurants and uh, I imagine, you know, uh, waste management um, at, at those places. So Mark, I'm going to give the screen over to you and uh, all right. Away. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and all right. Um, well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here and give an update. I think I did this uh, about three years ago, Steve, and so it's it's nice to be back. So just in case we have any repeat uh, people, I changed 95% uh, of the slides. So there's no repeats from three years ago. <laughs> and the some of the topics have changed, but I'm gonna go over a quick little overview of, here we go. So I'll introduce ourselves. We're gonna go over the drought. Um, and uh, what's going on with the drought situation, then some of our you know, city drought actions. And then I wanna talk also about restaurants and restaurant grease uh, as an important topic and um, we'll go from there. So uh, the city of Newport Beach serves about two thirds to 70% of the actual city for its water system. And then we also have portions of the city that have Mesa Water District, and then most of Newport Coast, which is Irvine Ranch Water District. Uh, but at the core is the city's operation. And we, we are kind of from an industry standpoint known as a 300 mile pipeline system, 26,000 uh, service connections. And then, um, and then, you know, us in the water system, we always kind of compare, uh, or notes about how, you know, how much how much do you have in storage? So we have we have one of the largest you know, storage reservoirs in, in Orange County with potable water with 200 million gallons and 30 days worth of supply um, with our Big Canyon Reservoir. And then with our elevation changes and things like that, we have a lot of pressure reducing stations and booster pumps and things like that, like many systems do. 
here's my little analogy or a little visual of what the equivalent is of every home or every business. You know, every home or business basically has this tanker truck hooked up in front of their house. And that tanker truck, you know, about 8,000 gallons a month provides that typical home with water or that business. And this is what it takes uh, to deliver visually. And this is the way I explain, explain it to, to children usually. Um, and then we are administered by our city council. And uh, this is uh, last year. This is a picture of former mayor uh, Brad Avery um, with one of our emergency repair jobs we had out on Coast Highway. And uh, our council members are heavily involved in our system and construction projects because they all intertie with kind of the bigger community purpose with streets and, and our utilities and parks and all of our departments have that, that intertie connection. And this was a, a great moment with where a uh, former mayor was out with us on that job site. And I have many pictures of, of them out there. Okay, well, I wanna go over some of the big picture things uh, regarding the drought. And we are, we are in a drought. And um, when you look at, uh, you know, out your window and you kind of quantify how much rain have we received this year, it feels like a lot less than it is. I mean, we've got about seven and a half inches, which is 60% of normal. That's just for Orange County. We rely on rainwater for recharging our basins and so on. Uh, Orange County, Southern California. Northern California, they got a little more rain, but it was still less than normal, 85% of normal. But then in the previous years, 48% and 63% of normal. So the accumulation of a lack of precipitation, which is you know, rain and snowfall, um, really kind of uh, adds up to not having um, as much water as we need and would like. And then Northern California snowpack, as they measure it from April 1st, just uh, a month ago, was 27% of what was normal. So uh, not a good situation. So in terms of the state, um, what the state has, has shown us is that 100% of the state is experiencing some sort of drought condition from a moderate to extreme. Here's another visual too about some of the uh, precipitation, like, uh, like we're talking about there with Orange County being 60% um, of our average and uh, in some of the other areas, you can see they're, they're just clearly below average and below average means you start basically using water that you have in your supply and we're not refilling our supplies. This is a graphic with, um, all of our reservoirs or a lot of our major state reservoirs. And you can see in the map there um, where we have our water coming from, from the Central Valley, uh, um, but mainly from the state water project from Northern California, and then also from the Colorado River. And so when you look up like Lake Oroville, Lake Shasta, Northern California, like, wow, I mean, 40 and 50% of, of where they should be. And then, then you look over to uh, the Colorado River Reservoirs, Lake Powell, 24%, Lake Mead, 31%. You know, those are our huge, huge water sources. And then our own major uh, local reservoirs, Diamond Valley out there in Hemet, which is at 69%. And, you know, Southern California Metropolitan Water District, you know, did an excellent job of filling up those reservoirs over the last couple of years when we had extra rain. But now we're drawing on that, you know, on that uh, reservoir. Here's another graphic, you know, with the timeline history of Lake Mead. Um, for our area in Orange County, a lot of our water comes from the Colorado River. And um, you can see as that continues to go down, you know, we're at some historic lows and there's some shortage triggers out there. And then there's, you know, Arizona and Nevada shortage triggers. And then there's California shortage triggers, which are at a different elevation. But um, not, not a pretty sight. So there, there's definitely a, a lack of water. And uh, this is again from, um, uh, from kind of a visual representation, you know, showing kind of the, the heat map or the drought map of, of California as it stands today, just from, uh, from last week. So that's kind of the bad news. I wanna then switch gears and talk about, in terms of our current situation, the good news. Well, 
here's the good news is, is in our area, we have been investing and we have what's called the Orange County Water District and we have a groundwater basin. And this basin has been managed for many, many years since the 1930s. And we've continued to reinvest into that basin to provide us some excellent water and reliability. And that's kind of one of the major differences from a lot of areas across the state or even in South County um, or in Los Angeles counties, we have uh, this incredible groundwater basin. But what we're doing there with our investments and projects is, is we're, we're trying to sustain it. So, and that's where um, one of the most important projects that they have, which is a recycling system comes into place here. And here's a little graphic of that. It's called the groundwater replenishment system. And so Orange County Water, they're taking in as much rainwater as they can, put it back, recharge the basin. We also have water that comes from above Prado Dam and gets recharged into the basin. And then we have the groundwater replenishment system, which is recycled ultra purified water that's put back into the groundwater system. So we can keep sustaining the groundwater system. And it's, a, it's an incredible facility. It's a hundred million gallons a day. If you're ever interested in a tour of that, you know, please reach out to me and I can help arrange that. And of course there's the, on their website, um, you can see um, they'll, they'll have a, um, a Zoom tour if you want. That's 100 million gallons a day, and they're currently expanding to 130 million gallons a day, which is an unbelievable amount of water. But this is our what we call the sound planning, the smart investments that we as a city, other agencies, and the district have put in place so we can be in a better position, be one of the best positions for, for droughts right, and water supply. So we have the overall state picture, which is uh, grim. And then we have our local picture, which is a happy face. And so now how do we mix these two together to come up with the right balance? Well, the answer is, is that you know, conservation is still an absolute key, right? It's, a, it's an Orange County lifestyle. You know, we want to use water efficiently. We want to applaud you know, families and businesses that are using water to the best of their ability and then reducing waste, right? And, and one of the overarching themes of this year's drought campaign is, you know, is Orange, is Orange County knows what to do, right? We, we know how to save water. We've done it before. We're as a, on the whole, we we're saving, uh, you know, like just for the city on the whole, we use 25 to 30% less water than we did 20 years ago, just on the whole, the whole area is using less and less water through conservation and education and making it a lifestyle. I want to talk about Newport now specifically, and I want to talk about you know customers. So when we think about our water system and, and who do we serve, right? We're serving single family homes, we're serving multifamily homes, you know, apartment complexes, things like that. We serve irrigation landscaping only areas. And then we have commercial businesses. And then we also have the city accounts too. When you think of the city parks and, and city community centers and, and uh, things like that. Well, one of the things that we're working on right now, and we're going to be actually presenting it at the next city council meeting on May 24th, is updating our water conservation ordinance. And so we've conducted a bunch of water use analysis. We've received you know, policy guidance from our city council and next Tuesday, we're gonna be presenting an updated uh, ordinance. And, what, and some of the things that are gonna be reinforced in the ordinance or changed has to do with our reduction of waste. Right? And, and here's one of the, the biggest ones, which is focusing on permanent restrictions. And so there's gonna be some real basic things like no washing down of hard services. This is already in the code, but again, reinforcing those. No watering after or during a rain event, you know, and making sure that there's no excessive irrigation runoff. Uh, you know, water pouring down the street in, in the gutter is a sign that water is being wasted and it's excessive. You know, and also we're going to enact no irrigation watering, no sprinkler watering, you know, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. because of all the evaporation. 
Um, council has directed us and we're gonna be you allocating water, right? When we quantify water, compare your water use, it's gonna be based off a historical water use pattern and what you've done in the past and making sure you don't go above and beyond that. We've also put in six water shortage levels. This was a state requirement. We previously had four water shortage levels or, or what we kind of call drought levels. Now there's six uh, drought levels. And the overarching theme is on wasted water and focusing on that. And we can get a lot of conservation um, with that. So when we do declare a drought stage, which is likely to come here, um, you know, it's, it's a huge focus on public education and outreach. All of our direct customer notifications, emails and utility bills, uh, changeable message signs, you know, signs at the entrances to tracks and things like that. And one of the big things that we're gonna talk about is a customer portal, right? Where, you, where customers can, as they pay their bill, they can right away see their water consumption use. And then if we need to, then we have to elevate things to our standard code enforcement process, which includes you know, violations of $100 and so on. Uh, that's our last resort. We really want to focus on the education and the information and, and generally people wanna do the right thing and reduce water and help the city out in the overall state too. So one of the big investments, again, sound planning that the city has made is in what we call our advanced water metering infrastructure. So when you look to the left here, you, you see a typical meter reader. He had a pencil and a pad and they went to every meter and they uh, read the dial and that's how you got billed and that's how we quantified it. And then in the 1990s, we're like, hey, we could do this better. Let's use technology. So they have these you know, digital keypads and sometimes some locations you could just drive by and it would automatically upload and read the, the meters. And, you know, we're using kind of technology, some wireless infrastructure, basically, you know, some of this, this digital stuff. Now we're going to a full-blown conversion. So think of our analog dial meters to digital meters with this metering infrastructure. And what does this look like? So every water meter now has a transponder that sends a signal to the city once a day with all the water information. And so from that, we can do all of our water billing, remote services, you, and connect our customers um, to their water use, and as well as our kind of operations center to monitor for leaks. And this is huge, right? So the customer benefits that we are already finding with our new digital water meters, or also called AMI, it's unbelievable. Leak detection, this is, we're making tremendous uh, strides here in detecting leaks. So a lot of times, you know, residents, businesses have a leak and they don't even know it. It's just going underground. We're in a sandy soil condition and they never even see it. Their water bill goes up, but they're maybe thinking, oh, well, that's kind of normal. It's just inflation. It just keeps going up. Our system now is detecting all the time. Every morning we get a report of some continuous leak detections. And then our staff is able to go out there, talk to the resident or business, put a door tag if you need to. Hey, you got a leak. Our system has det detected that your water meter is spinning all night long, right? Slowly in a lot of cases, but it's spinning and you have a leak. So tremendous uh, some, um, capabilities there too. And then we're just about to roll out a customer web portal where residents can go in as they pay their bill and they can actually see their water use. They could see how much their landscaping is using. They can see, uh, you know, showers and laundry time and different things like that and, and make decisions based on that. Then from us, you know, from a city standpoint, I'm our customer service. When somebody calls in regarding a, a water question, we could pull up their account right away, see their reads, talk to them about what was going on last week with their water use. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, not to mention the whole meter reading savings, you know, in, in terms of not sending out people to, to read the meters, but this is really the overarching water conservation focus and, and, uh, and, and um, it's really important and being highly successful. We're about two thirds of the way done with the installation, but it's already paying big dividends um, uh, for customers. So here's an example of 
of the data that's generated, right? In very, very simple terms, you know, residents are going to love seeing this, right? Where they can see like, wow, look at throughout the day, this is how much water I use just for my everyday use, right? Some units here, a one, a 10, a 15, but then when my sprinklers kick on, whoa, look at, look at all the water that's being used during those sprinklers. Maybe those sprinklers are on a little too long. You know, if I, if I cut my sprinkler time from five minutes to four minutes, I've just saved 20% water right there. And then the portal that is going to be rolled out here is going to be, you know, fully integrated with billing, with maps, with comparisons, with data. It's, it's a tremendous amount of information for folks that are interested in it. But even if they're not interested in it, if they have a problem, we could pull it up and we can talk to them about it. We can go into right into the details, help them solve problems, help them reduce their water use. And uh, it's going to be a, a highly effective tool. So now in the city system, you know, we recognize that one of our major water uses has to do with landscaping and irrigation, right? We, we own all the city parks and, and we have the entrances to the medians. And so what we've invested in over the last 10 years is basically a state-of-the-art irrigation system, uh, controller system, and then landscaping. You see a lot of landscaping projects that the city has done over the years to convert from heavy water use to lighter water use to, and, um, and drought friendly planting. You know? And we're also expanding our recycled water system um, use. So, so right now in construction, we're adding the Jamboree medium from Santa Barbara to the Hyatt that's under construction, that street. Again, the city can then do it as part of the city umbrella with the paving project to add recycled water there to the median. And you are going to see some grass uh, medians there, but they're going to be using recycled water. Um, I want to talk real quick from, for the business community about what's kind of coming from the state. So right now there's draft regulations that are going to be focusing on, this is coming from, from the state, that require the removal or the non-watering of non-functional turf non-functional grass. So this is, you know, grass or turf that's solely ornamental, not used for any recreation. So think of your commercial business areas, think of parkways and business entrances. So here's a, just a typical picture of a little corner. This is a bank and they have a little bit of grass. You can think of a gas station. You can think of an industrial business. You can think of uh, a car dealership that all have a little bit of beautification grass there. And what the state has said is, is they are going to enact rules that are going to prohibit having grass or turf at those locations. So the information is still yet to become in terms of guidance of when and who's going to enforce and, and all that. But it is very likely to come and, uh, and come soon, probably this summer. So more to come on that. Thing. I want to switch gears from water to wastewater also known as sewer, right? And we uh, you know, take pride and we have, a, we have a, a great group of folks that are running to basically clean our and protect our sewer system so we can prevent spills, right? Our number one goal there is to prevent sewer overflows and sewer spills. We know how close we are to the harbor and to the ocean, and we wanna do everything we can to prevent that. And because once it enters there, it just creates a catastrophe, it's a mess. People can't use the water. It's just, we, we want to protect our harbor and bay. And so our group has a huge focus on that. They're the big yellow trucks out there. They're very noticeable and we like them noticeable, right? I mean, even knowing what they're doing provides some comfort uh, because they are, are doing an important kind of uh, behind the scenes factor there. A lot of emergency response, customer service, and I think that's an overarching thing. If you have a question, something's going on with your sewer line, call us. We're not going to charge you. We just want to go out there. We want to check it, fix it, give you our recommendation and move on. But with regards to restaurants, you know, restaurants are a big focus of ours. And we, you know, inspect every restaurant in the city, sometimes four times a year, because we are focused on trying to help them reduce their grease. Because right, grease is a major factor 
that comes from uh, restaurants and they can plug up sewer lines very, very quickly. So we have a regular program to inspect every restaurant in the city. It's a free service. We want people to call us too. And you get, if you call us, you get a live body. There's no phone tree. You get the live body right away. And we're going to take care of your thing and, and act on it. But one of the recommendations that, that, and I know Steve, you've sent out some of this email too, is regarding restaurants. And we do this in our actual, in, in our personalized outreach when our inspector comes out and talks to the restaurant manager. Really, but I want to focus on, on this again. She was just about training your staff about why we're doing this kind of grease prevention and what's and, and the proper kitchen methods to prevent sewer backups. You know, the concept is also important that, you know, as a restaurant, you really should have a plumber on speed dial. It's that important, right? Build a relationship with somebody because when you need them, you know, you want to be able to call somebody and not, not scramble for the, uh, the phone book. Have, some, have a relationship. Train your staff. If they see a, a sewer drain backing up, act quickly, right? Shut off the water. Don't use the water. And then a slow drain is the, the beeping red light. Something is wrong. And so some, someone should act quickly, including calling us if you need to. We'll go out there. We'll help you. And lastly, as I kind of wrap this up to just in terms of the business community, I want to just kind of recap with, you know, uh, with street sweeping too. This is one of our other important functions that we provide. We're really proud of the fact that we sweep everywhere in the city at least once a week. A lot of the business communities are actually swept twice a week. When you think of in our, in our parking lots and commercial areas, every single day we have five different street sweepers running across the city picking up um, and sweeping trash. We do our alleys and, and, and special, and we'll do special sweeps if we need to. Point is to call us if you need, if we're not meeting the mark on something, we wanna go out there and fix it and sweep it. Um, that is a point of pride of us as a city, as a city operation with our utilities, you know, uh, to do kind of this kind of comprehensive, it's water, it's wastewater, it's, it's street sweeping, it's all of our storm drains, it's all kind of intertied together, you know, on behalf of the residents and the businesses. And Steve, that's, uh, that kind of concludes my presentation. I wanna just thank everyone for the opportunity to, um, to present and, and, uh, and I'd like to turn it back to you, Steve, and see if you have any questions and I'll stop, uh, stop sharing here. Well, it was a pretty uh, comprehensive uh, update. Thank you, Mark. Um, I should have mentioned going into this that if any of our participants on this uh, webinar have questions, please uh, put the question into the Q and A, and we'll I'll try and um, grab those. But I, you know, until we get a few in there, um, I do have a couple myself. So um, one of the things that you talked about was uh, in coming up with this whatever our program is going to be is um, basing uh, some of these restrictions or, or limitations on historical use. So, and I know that's always kind of a rub between like people on my end of town who, you know, I have a little strip of, of dirt out in front that has a few plants. I water it, you know, twice a week maybe. And uh, other than that, I'm not using any water. And, but then you go to, you know, other areas in town where they have huge yards and, you know, significant landscaping, obviously they're using 10x the water than I am. And so I'm stuck with, you know, one tenth of the allocation that they are. So how do you handle those um, kind of issues? Great question, Steve. So um, one of the better ways is to use what's called water budgets. And you kind of calculate based on the need, the size of the lot, how much landscaping and, and do that. Our council said, hey, let's focus on, on the averages for now as we develop budgets and do outreach on budgets. What we built into the code is basically protection, what I, what I would call protection for the efficient water users. So if you're already using water at these minimal levels, you're already below the basic budget calculation and you're not gonna be asked to cut back more on these early drought stages. Now, it's gonna be about the higher water users. So if you, for example, let's just say um, you use less than 10 units a month, you know, you're an efficient water user. And therefore, 
you're not going to be penalized or asked to cut back. Now, you still might be able to. You still might be able to cut a little bit and do something. And, and that's great. But um, we're building into the code, you know, kind of the minimum levels to, to protect the, the, the folks that are already highly efficient. Do you, do you anticipate that there'll be like tiering of water rates based on usage or? I mean, there could be, you know, that's a method a lot of agencies use. I mean, it's not what we've, we've uh, you know, suggested that as an option. Our council prefers more of a simplified approach and, uh, you know, based on, on water consumption, yeah. So um, another issue that comes up, you know, especially like I own some duplexes and, um, you know, depending on how many tenants I have in there, my water usage is going to fluctuate. And in fact, I have one unit that's been vacant for a while now because the tenant, uh, you know, he, he had a medical situation. He had to go home and look, or go back east and live with some relatives for a while and then ultimately decided to not come back. And now I'm in the process of renovating the unit. So it's been vacant for maybe six months, let's say. Um, all told. So obviously my water usage went in half while he was gone and there was only one person up there. Maybe right. now three or four people will be living up there. Um, so how do you handle situations like that where, you know, historical usage, especially in this last year, wouldn't be indicative of what normal usage would be for that building? Sure. So like our current code um, compares your usage back in 2013, which is, you know, feels like a century ago. <laughs> and uh, right now we're, we're, we're going to be comparing to 2019 water usage. So if you had full occupancy in 2019, then you were using kind of a full amount of water and that's what you're going to be kind of measured against. But let's just say in 2019, um, you were doing that renovation, that construction, nobody lived there. Yeah. So that's totally fair. And what that means is, and we have this built into the code is, is then we can raise your allowance and say, look, hey, nobody was there. That uh, Steve's baseline should really be this much. Here's his average. Here's a reasonable amount. And um, here's what he used maybe in 2018. We can go back and compare that. And we can make that change um, for a lot of those special circumstances. A lot of people are going to come to us and say, look, hey, I didn't own that home. I didn't live there in 2019. That was another family. And they, they did things differently. Now I have my family here. This is what we're doing. We're going to say, okay, great. The code allows us to change that based on those circumstances of what's really happening there. The other thing, uh, one of the other things you mentioned was that we have uh, a large uh, reservoir at Big Canyon, which you know helps protect us a little bit against um, you know this drought situation, probably earthquake situations too, where water service might be interrupted from like Northern California or something. Um, and, but that's on the east side of town, obviously. What, how does that cover the west side of town too? I know there's a reservoir under the city you know, yard facility, um, but I don't think it's nearly the size of Big Canyon. So how's that handled in a drought situation? Yeah, good question. So you know, from a drought standpoint, the reservoir is, is one thing. It's really kind of more, it's more about emergency supply, right? Let's just pretend that our pipelines get severed, our we can't pump groundwater. We can't get water from Colorado River for some sort of reason. And so that reservoir is there to provide us 30 days worth of water. And But with that, we can supply every part of town with that reservoir. So the pipelines, you know, water system is really, the most important part of a water system is redundancy. And so we can send water different directions, different ways, and that water can can supply water. And we did that actually, we were in construction here at our 16th street reservoir and booster station. We had it shut down for a while. And so we were supplying hundred percent of the water from the, the big Canyon reservoir. And so it can send water um, out that way. Yeah. All right, we got a, I've got a lot more questions, but we have a few in the queue. Yeah. I'm gonna give somebody else a chance here. So one of our anonymous attendees says, what's a reasonable time duration per shower that you recommend? <laughs> and I'll, I'll just add, do you recommend showering with a friend maybe to conserve water? <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> the first one or the second one? <laughs> Probably both. I mean, you know, everyone has to kind of make that call for themselves, right? I mean, I, I think it's, it's just a little bit different. I mean, if you, if, you know, a part of water conservation is asking yourself, are you being reasonable and you being efficient? So, you know, if you have, a, a, let's say, a smaller family and you want to take a few extra minutes in your shower, like, OK, it's OK, it's fine, you know. Um, but if water is running down your gutter, you know, then 
maybe you should take a two minute shower. You know, I mean, it's kind of that kind of thing, but I don't know. Five minutes is where my, that's my, that's my goal every less than five minutes. So that's what I'm always screaming the kid to the kids about. So get out of the shower. It's been five minutes. <laughs> well, as I mentioned before we went live, I, I, you know, I'm feeling a little guilty now. So I stopped shaving in the shower. So that I think <laughs> saves some water, hopefully. Um, yeah, but you have no landscaping, right? I know. I mean, well, that's what I'm saying. I should have maybe, you know, cause that's how people think. Well, you know, I don't have a big yard to water, so I should be able to shower and shave in the shower because that's how I want to use my chunk of the water that's out there. And because I, I know, I, you know, I was a city councilman, obviously, you know that. And, yeah. and that's what people would say to me sometimes, you know, hey, you know, it's not fair that I have to make, make do with less because, you know, historically I've used less. Everybody should give, be given like a, a base amount and then you pay yeah. above and maybe like I said, and, or something else. Yeah. And that's what we have. We have that base amount in there. So. All right. Another question. Um, and I think this is the big Canyon reservoir they're referring to, but is there a plan for the empty reservoir next to Pacific view mortuary? Isn't that big Canyon? That's yeah, that's a big Canyon reservoir. So it has a floating cover on it, right? It has a, has a big, uh, black floating cover on there, which, you know, protects the water quality, prevents the evaporation. And so from, from the mortuary, from other areas, when you see that, sometimes it looks actually empty, right? Because it's, it's already covered, but there's water, there's 20 some feet of water in there already. Yeah, I know that was one of our conservation measures. I mean, that was an expensive little <laughs> cover to put on there, but it saves a lot of evaporation from that. Definitely. And as well as contamination, yeah. right? And contamination, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it was huge. It was <laughs> I know that we have a pond out back here of our office and these big geese or crapping in there like crazy. <laughs> I won't want them doing that in my drinking water. That's, that's right. That's right. That's yeah. why we have a protection. Do you filter that? How is that water treated actually when it comes out of the reservoir? Does it just go straight into the pipeline or does it go through some type of treatment? Well, we have a, um, the water going in there is already finished water. So yeah. it already has, you know, just in basic terms, already has the chlorine in it and it's been oh. already purified. And so, but we are checking it on the way out. And so if it needs any finishing, you know, some additional dosage of chlorine, it just gets finished as it gets sent out, but it's already treated. You could drink it straight from there. It's ready to go. Okay, great. Another question, uh, Mark Goggin uh, says, uh, regarding the metering system, it reminds me of my flow mowing or water cop system. These systems run daily tests and give me a report. Will the city system give me access to information collected daily and self-reporting? Yeah, so once we get the customer portal online, um, which is gonna be here shortly in the next two months, um, you can then access your account, you can see your bill, you can see your past history, and then you can drill down and see your daily use. So you can look at it from a Monday through Friday, you know, Saturday, Sunday standpoint, 30 days, 90 days, 180 days, but you can see every day's worth of use, and then you can break it down and see the hourly use as well too. So it's yeah. going to be a lot of information. Yeah, it's, it's actually going to be too much information. And it just depends if people find value in it. That's why some of those graphs where you just see the big spike and you're like, whoa, OK, that, that gets my attention. Maybe I can look into that and see what's yeah. going on. I can see some landlords like checking their buildings and, and sending nasty notes to their tenants. Stop using so much water you know, <laughs> <laughs> as, as they go on there, you know, like watching the stock market and they see the value of your uh, portfolio. They're going to see the. <laughs> their uh, level of water usage. So um, here's a good question um, from Carmen Rawson. Uh, she says, in 2019, many people were still going to an office to work. And that's the, that's the base year that you're planning on using, right, 2019. Since COVID, many people started to work from home. So that affects increases residential water consumption. It seems to me that 2020 would be a better indicator to use as my tenants, for example, still work from home. Yeah, great question. It's, it's a big debate out there whether to use 2019 or 2020. And it kind of cuts both ways um, because 2020 was an anomaly year, right? And so a lot, everyone was home for, <laughs> for a while there. And so then that number and that year is, is just highly variable, highly inflated from a residential standpoint, maybe not on commercial. But so that's why we're focusing on 2019. It's the most normal year possible. So now, again, in the code, we have these kind of allowances built into place. It's like, hey, if something's really going on different than it was in 2019, 
we can then make those changes and change your baseline. I mean, just like if you had a budget, right? I mean, there's, there's all these different things that change and you have to allow for variances and additions, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it actually could cut both ways because I mean, realistically, even if you're still at home and you're know, working from home, you're really not, you know, probably using much, maybe you're making coffee at home instead of at the office, but people are still showering and watering their landscaping and doing the normal things that they would do. In fact, you could probably say that people who work from home might shower less. <laughs> their water consumption might've gone down because, hey, I'm not going to the office. I don't have to shower or shave today. You know, I'm just going to sit here in uh, my pajamas and not turn on the video on the Zoom. <laughs> meetings yeah, that's that right. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I guess that could cut both ways. Yeah. Um, I see a follow-up question there too. It says, what if my landlady doesn't set up the customer portal, you know, how can I check the usage? You know, that's a great question. Um, I will have to look into that, you know, can, so as a tenant, could you still have access to your water use, even though you're not paying the bill directly, you're not the account holder. And what about tenants? And I don't have an answer for that, but I'll, I'm going to look into that. It's a good suggestion. Yeah, yeah, that would be good to be able to have, uh, give your tenants access to that information. You know, I know uh, actually to follow up on that with my own tenants, you know, it is a lag time because I'll get a water bill. All of a sudden the water bill is a hundred dollars higher. And then it was, you know, it was a $200 water bill and now it's a $300 water bill. And invariably the toilet is running in the mm -hmm. unit and they didn't tell me for a month it's running just in the toilet. And so you got to call them up and say, hey, do you have any toilets that are constantly running? And they say, oh, yeah, by the way, I've been meaning to call you about that. And, yeah. and so this, I mean, I don't know that I'm going to be going on checking water consumption all the time, but certainly once I see the water bill, it'll be giving me a, a handy well, tool to go in and see if it actually has spiked or, you know, what if it's just running constantly, like you say, all night. Yeah. Wow. yeah. But that's where we can do it for you, right? I mean, that's going to be the big benefit is, is that our system is now going to detect, hey, that toilet was running all night long, right? And, and it's not typical to have water use all night long. Right. And so that's going to buzz us first thing in the morning. Hey, this, this business or this house was using water all night long. Something's going on there. And then we do a service call out there. There's no charge for it. It doesn't cut, but we go out there because we want to cut the water use, cut the waste. I'm going to That'll save down. you as a landlord. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a, certainly an expense that I could avoid. Um, so I'm going to drop down here because this has actually been in the news. So what's your opinion about desalinization? Um, I know that the Poseidon project in Huntington Beach has been going on for 10 or 20 years. I think they've been trying to yeah. build a, a desal plant there next to the um, power generating station. And I guess at the last Coastal, Committee, or Coastal Commission meeting, they unanimously voted the project down again. I think for the second or third time they've been there with that. So, um, you know, I know there's issues around desalinization. It's expensive water. Do we really need it? Should we be doing more water conservation things? I'm answering a question for you, I guess, but what, what are your thoughts on it? Well, you know, our city council hasn't taken a, a position on it. I mean, and, and so that's kind of, I guess, my thought on it. <laughs> <laughs> You're a man who wants to keep his job, huh? <laughs> And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it went last week in front of the, the Coastal Commission and it was, you know, it was turned down. So I don't know if there's going to be a, an appeal in place that, that goes. It's kind of the interesting thing is it actually gets appealed to the federal government from there if they decide to appeal it. So we'll kind of see what happens. You know, there's just there's just a lot of um, competing, uh, you know, thoughts on it. And, and everyone has, you know, different thoughts on, on this regarding water. and um, so our council, I think wisely has just kind of stayed on the sideline on that too. You know, there's definitely some concerns and there's definitely some potential benefits, you know, and, and, uh, but, you know, it's probably not over yet. So. <laughs> yeah, really. You mentioned um, something else earlier in your conversation when you were talking about replacing landscaping that, um, that I guess the medians over there in Fashion Island are, are watered by recycled water. I think there's other um, areas that, of the city that have some recycled water usage. Is there, a, and I, I, from my recollection, that water comes from Irvine Ranch Water District or somewhere where they're using basically water that's non-potable. So it's not drinkable water. So it's not like we're using drinkable drinking water on this landscaping. Is there plans to, you know, pipe 
other areas of town for recycled water so that we can take advantage of that resource? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Yeah, we're working on some expansions, like like I mentioned, you know, expanding the Jamboree median. Newport Center is not on recycled water, but they did during the last drought change over a lot of their grass landscaping to a different kind of ground cover. We did a lot with our medians to you think of like uh, San Joaquin Hills Road median. That was all grass and now it's a ground cover. We converted over. Um, you know, that area of town is, is served by us in terms of recycled water it comes from the Orange County um, Orange County Water District, so it's the water water Orange County Water District recycled. Irvine Ranch Water District has their recycled water system. They do serve parts of the city, like for example in our, our Benita Canyon Sports Park. That's on recycled water, which yeah. comes from Irvine Ranch and so on, but not in Newport Center yet. We are working with them on it, but the golf courses are big ones, like Big Canyon Country Club. Uh, Newport Beach, uh, you know, Country Club, those are all on recycled water. Those all come from Orange County Water District, but they come through our system and our pump stations uh, to get to them. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dennis Bress has a long uh, thing in here, but basically he says that when he was traveling in Europe, the hotel or wherever he was staying had these little uh, water timers on suction cups that I guess you put on the wall in your shower and it gives you an idea of how long you've been taking a shower. Um, do you think that that might be kind of a handy giveaway tool for residents here to say, hey, look, you know, maybe I, I'm in here a little longer than I thought, you know, and I need to, you know, speed it up a little bit. Uh, great suggestion. We actually have those. And when we have events, we give them out. They're little shower timers and you click a button and it has a five minute. Uh, so there's the answer. It's five minute showers, right? It has a five minute countdown timer on it. And it's a suction cup, you put it in your shower and then it beeps after five minutes or you can see how long you take from there. And so we give those out. We have, every time there's a community event, we were handing out those, those shower timers. Yeah. Okay, um, well, then Dennis says, awesome. <laughs> so I guess yeah. he's happy. Um, and then the last question in the Q&A here is from Barbara Waller. She wants to know if you're gonna be doing any PSAs uh, showing people how to conserve water. Um, I'm not exactly sure how you would do that other than NBTV, which, you know, a lot of people don't watch, but I, I, are there, is there gonna be like a mailing campaign or some kind of literature you're gonna be sending out telling people about these new rules and regulations? Yeah, I mean, you have, you know, what are the new rules as they come about? And, and then you have actually, you know, kind of best practices tips. And so we're gonna use a multiple effort front um, where we have, you know, through social media, through our website, and then through direct mailings, you know, things that get put in their bill, or, you know, sometimes people don't read their bill, right? They're on auto pay. And then so we, we're also going to be sending out postcards and reminders. Mm -hmm. And we're putting it in, you know, you'll see different notes on, you know, some of these different, you know, um, let's say, for example, Stu News or the Daily Pilot, you know, people that read those articles. And we have water conservation messages there too. And then as things get more serious, we use kind of a little more blunt tactics, like a changeable message sign in front of your street. <laughs> you know, it says, hey, we're in a drought or conserve water. Or if we need to go that way, hey, your watering day is Monday and Friday, you know, things like that. I have a suggestion. You should use those tsunami warning megaphones. <laughs> woke me up at 2.30 in the morning uh, about a week and a half ago. Um, I don't know if you know about it. It went, <laughs> went off in West Newport all of a sudden. My wife goes, what is that? What is this a voice? But it actually broadcasts your, you know, you could use it as a PSA, uh, you know, through the- uh, Well, we, we could, right? I mean, those, the new uh, system is, is pretty advanced because you can use voice information. It's not just a, a, a sound, uh, but we want to save that for, you know, some <laughs> severe situations, right? I mean, let's talk about mega, you know, severe issue that comes about or major earthquake or something like that. Yeah, but think about it. You could be sitting, you know, at the control panel there and you zero in on, you know, <laughs> my house, let's say, four, well, I'm not going to say over here, my, my house, you say, and then you get on that megaphone, you go, hey, Steve Rosansky, <laughs> you need to turn your water off. <laughs> I mean, that, you know, that's an intimidation factor, I think, that most people won't be able to resist. So uh, yeah. th think about it. I mean, it's out of the box, but you never know, right? <laughs> yep, yep. I wrote it down. I wrote, yeah, it, write down. it, down. <laughs> I wrote it down. Come on. I'm going to let you take credit for that one, too. Okay. You All right. Make the, the um, uh, presentation to council on that. All right. Good. So, uh, well, it's a little tongue in cheek, but obviously it is a, a huge problem. I mean, as we discussed earlier, 
this is not a problem that's going to go away. This is it's only going to get worse, not better, as far as you know, water and uh, you know, climate change and things like that. And, you know, you don't have to believe that man, it's man-made or what, but it just seems to be happening. And so there's no point arguing about is it happening. I think it's more you know how are we going to deal with it and you know going forward and. Obviously, it's going to take a lot of adjustment. It's probably going to take a lot of time. I mean, you know, that bank that you were showing there, Union Bank with the grass lawn, is, you know, not going to just pull out their landscaping tomorrow. And, uh, you know, we've got, you know, 5,000 properties like that around right. town that would need to, to do that, including that big grass lawn out in front of Newport Center that uh, probably sucks up a lot of water. So it's something that we're just going to have to adjust to. And, and hopefully, you know, it won't be with too much hair pulling because... Hey, I don't have a lot of hair. <laughs> so on that note, thank you, Mark. Um, and uh, this, we have recorded this uh, presentation. So if you want to, anybody wants to go back and come to our website at uh, newportbeach.com and, and uh, click onto the video section, you'll be able to watch it again or you know, send the link to a friend that uh, might be interested. So I know you have a busy day. I'm going to let you um, okay. sign off. We do have a couple of our legislative reps with us uh, this morning. So thanks, Steve. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so let me pull up. Uh, I'm going to promote uh, first uh, Sergio Prince, who's with us. So let me do that. And he will be coming on and telling us what's going on with uh, Lisa Bartlett's office. Um, here we go. So Sergio. Oh, actually, I think I just I, think I need to promote you to a panelist. Here we go. So Sergio is going to give us an update on Lisa Bartlett's office. So Lisa is the fifth district supervisor, and she um, Newport Beach is now in the fifth district. So Sergio, good morning. You hear me, Steve? Whoa, you're all dressed up. I don't usually see you in a in a suit. Well, it's your fault, man, because we're going mayor's, to the uh, mayor's dinner. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You better get a tie then, too. Oh, that's, that's where I draw <laughs> the line. Draw the line. I'm not paying right enough for a tie, right? <laughs> well, a lot's been going on um, in the 5th District. Uh, we had uh, the coastal fire um, recently in Laguna Niguel. I'm happy to say that it's 100% contained, but not before burning down um, over 20 spectacular homes in uh, Laguna Niguel. And, and affecting a lot of families. Um, and it's really ironic too, because we had the Emerald Fire um, recently as well. And, and just the week before, uh, Supervisor Bartlett was in Emerald Bay to honor Orange County Fire Authority and Station 11 that were the first responders on that uh, scene of that fire. And then we had this one that was much more devastating um, in Laguna Niguel. Yeah, we had a lot of uh, Newport Beach uh, firefighters up there. Actually, the one oh, yeah, no, there was a lot of mutual aid, a lot of mutual aid, and there was and, one that was injured. He was from Newport. Yeah, Beach. thank thank God for mutual aid. Um, it, it really saved the day. Um, but what's interesting about both fires is that both fires occurred when um, at the same time that I was going to the uh, Corona Del Mar Government Affairs meeting, and now I'm really suspicious of that chamber. Um, I don't know if there's any coincidence. I'm just kidding. You know, uh, I I don't go there. Linda Leonard, she's you know, she's she's not so not someone I want to cross. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then we also had that uh, horrific uh, shooting in Laguna Woods um, last Sunday, where um, an armed gunman uh, went into the church and um, killed um, a doctor who is now a hero for helping to stop him and. Um, in fact, today, Supervisor Bartlett is going to be participating in a press conference in Laguna Woods with city officials and um, uh, the DA's office um, and our Orange County um, Human Relations Commission um, to help uh, promote the healing process for that community. Um, but it's it's been a hard time for, uh, for our district and our constituents. Um, but we recently had the uh, State of the Fifth District luncheon in uh, Laguna Niguel. And, um, and thank you, Steve, and your chamber for, for your help and participation in that. That was a great success. I'll be leaving um, my information um, in the chat box here in, in a second. Um, but the entire State of the Fifth District presentation is on video. And uh, you can access it through our um, website or through our newsletter. And I, I highly encourage you to uh, check it out. It was a, a very well attended event. and, and um, and uh, it's a very informative presentation. 
Um, we also have uh, OC micro business grants available to small businesses. Um, there are there's some criteria to qualify. I won't get into the weeds now, but again, all this information is in our newsletter that goes out every Friday. I highly encourage you to check it out and, and read everything in depth. Um, you can access me directly and I can sign you up or you could go to our uh, website and sign up. And it's very simple. It's SUP soup Bartlett at um, OC, I'm sorry, SUP Bartlett.com. That's it, SUP Bartlett.com. And then uh, next week on the 24th, uh, Supervisor Bartlett is hosting a blood drive in Newport Beach. It's going to be from 11 to 5 at the Oasis Senior Center in uh, Corona Del Mar. And um, but those seniors, they can't afford to give up blood. I don't know why you're over there. <laughs> <laughs> they need all the blood they have. <laughs> yeah. Well, I gave already, so I'm, I'm covered. Okay. Um, but the anyways, that'll be 11 to 5 at the Oasis Senior Center. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be at the uh, Wake Up Newport uh, 40th Annual Mayor's Dinner tonight. Uh, Supervisor Bartlett will be presenting a proclamation to speak of new, uh, for, in honor of the 40th annual um, event. Uh, and, okay. So I'm going to, yeah, correct you there, because otherwise I'm going to get all kinds of grief. It's actually speak up Newport Mayor's Dinner. Oh, what did I say? You, well, first you said wake up Newport, which is an event that we do. And oh, it's, yeah. And it's, it is a little source of friction. Uh, over the years that uh, when I came in, you know, when I developed our breakfast meeting, I called it Wake Up Newport. And uh, they thought I was infringing on their, uh, you know, their their up Newport thing. <laughs> so, oh, yes, absolutely. So well, it, it actually, I'm so, actually a little jealous because out of all the events we do, and we do a dozen major civic events a year, that's one that I really wish we also did, you know, in town, because it is a very prestigious event. We'll have like 400 people you know, the people who are really the movers and shakers in, in the city will, will be there, so. Well, thanks to you, we've been in touch with Ed and he, um, and we're looking forward to meeting him in person tonight. And uh, and the reason why I got confused because Wake Up Newport is actually the next thing on my list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yes, uh, uh, we have the video of that now also in our newsletter. I know it's on uh, the Chamber website as well, um, but uh, it's a, a great presentation, uh, Supervisor Bartlett, um, presented on topics of mutual interest to both the county and the city. And so I would encourage people um, who have an interest in that to check it out. Uh, we'll, uh, we're sponsoring, Surprise of is sponsoring the uh, Corona Del Mar 40th Annual Scenic 5K coming up on June 4th. And um, today the supervisor will be at the Aliso Viejo Ranch where they're presenting a historical plaque. And our Orange County Historical Commission will be there in attendance, including um, our most recent um, appointee that's represent the fifth district and that's uh, Bernie Spalstad from Newport Beach, uh, your um, uh, Newport Beach Historical Society president. And he's been a welcome addition to our commission. We're happy to have him. Um, and then, um, yeah, lastly, I mentioned to speak up the uh, Newport um, event tonight. So that's it. I'll leave my information in the chat box. If you want to reach out, uh, get signed up for a newsletter, happy to do it. Great. Well, thank you for that. Uh comprehensive report and i'll see you uh you know cocktail hour starts at six yeah with no tie no tie okay <laughs> <laughs> i could bring you one <laughs> all right so next up we have uh sonia I, ter, i'm gonna I'm not mispronounce this i'm, I'm hoping it's terwisk terwiski terwisk or terwiski and i believe she's with um congresswoman Steele's office i'm going to promote her to a panelist and she wants to join us and give us a little report on what's happening in Washington, D.C. That would be great. There's Sonia. There she is. Oh, can't hear you. Got a... Yes. Hi. It is true whiskey. So true whiskey. Got, okay. Yeah, you got that right. I covered all the bases. <laughs> <laughs> but I do get to whisk a lot. It's a Polish last name and K-E is K. It's pronounced K. -E. Whiskey. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I'll start with the earliest to the latest. Um, and so I'll start with the Harvard Act. Um, the Congresswoman did um, sponsor and create the Harvard Act. What that is, it's um, helping applicants receive valid and reasonable decisions. Um, so what that act does is it allows for college, for all colleges to um, 
disclose their um, criteria for college ex acceptance. What had been found was that colleges were using personality traits like um, widely respected and um, liked as a grounds for accepting students versus uh, being merit-based. So the Congresswoman is fighting and urging universities to accept students based on merits. Um, so stay tuned uh, for that one. Um, the next one is the Protecting Charter Schools from Federal Overreach Act. Uh, she sponsored that one and in hopes of minimizing the federal reach um, when it comes to charter schools. So what charter schools um, sometimes time to time they have to do if they want to get started in a city is they have to justify the need for them to start. And um, versus, so for example, if there's already a public school, um, you know, the federal government might come back and say, well, you don't need a charter school because there already is a public school. Just an example. So that would be an example of a federal overreach. So she is trying to promote um, charter school, it, just fighting and being an advocate for that, for education as a whole. And as you guys know, the Surfside Sunset and Newport Beach replenishment project did pass. So um, it's, um, I hope you guys know that. That's a, that's a good one because I think our beaches have been long overdue for repair. So um, finally, the US Army Corps of Engineers are looking into the beach repair and they're gonna get that going. So we can maintain our beautiful beaches. She also spoke up on um, immigration. She spoke up on uh, securing our borders and more so that we have roughly 4.4 million people waiting in the line wanting to legally immigrate to the United States. So she is for legal immigration and she did speak uh, to secure our borders. And she also met with the California Restaurant Association and um, just to kind of move that language and what the restaurants have been doing and how they're coming back in these recent months and what their strategy for success looks like. Um, recently in the last few days, I'm sure you guys have noticed about um, that we're short on baby formula. And um, she addressed that, but not only she addressed that, she wrote a legislation and it passed the house. So what that legislation will do is that it hopefully it will prevent future crisis like this um, because we do have a lot of pregnant women and moms um, that um, are on a WIC, it's a government uh, program, it's a WIC program, it's uh, for low-income mothers that do rely heavily on, um, I mean, just a lot of, a lot of the things like the formula. Um, so what are they gonna do when, you know, stores run out of all that food? And so we're really trying to prevent that because babies under one, I mean, I have, I have a nine month old, they need their food, they need their, um, milk and they do rely on either breast milk or baby formula a lot. So she is, um, I'm glad that, yeah, she worked hard for that one and it passed. So I hope that this crisis doesn't happen in the future. She did hold um, a moment of silence uh, with Congressman Levin and Congresswoman Porter um, for Dr. John Chang, um, who was, um, who, Past, sacrificed um, his life at the Laguna Woods shooting. Um, and then we were actually supposed to hold our office hours in Laguna Niguel the Friday of the fire, um, but we postponed that to the coming weeks when we have more um, direction from the fire authority and the leaders there as to what exactly they need from our office. We were just gonna do a general office hours but just with the fire in mind, we want to kind of also cater our help more towards the families that do need whatever specific type of help that might be. So that's all I have for you. Um, if you have any questions or anything, go ahead and ask or email, whatever works. No, I think that pretty much covers it, Sonia. I don't, I don't think, have we met before? Because I don't recall. Yes, we, we have. I've actually, you've actually met quite a few times. <laughs> well, I feel I mean like three or four. 
So. Do, is she is she promoting any bills for dementia people like me no. <laughs> who can't remember who they met? Um, no, thank you for the report. Um, and um, you know, uh, the one thing that I did zero in on is the little bipartisan uh, minute of uh, silence or whatever between the, the Congress people. It's a shame that someone has to die for uh, our Congress people yeah. to work together. But hopefully that's not the end, but the beginning of, of a little bit more uh, bipartisanship mm -hmm. in Washington. We can certainly use that as um, I think our country seems to be more and more fractured. So thank you very much for that update. I don't see anybody else in the queue um, with the legislative rep office. If you are in the queue, you know, put send me something quickly in the chat and um, I'll add you in, but I'm gonna pretty much um, close this session out. Um, please, if you wanna join us, we have our uh, chamber mixer next month at or next week sorry at Bayside restaurant on May 26th um, if you're a chamber member come between 5 and 5 30 we're going to have our annual meeting where we'll elect our new board of directors and if uh, if you're want to just come for the for the fun it starts at 5 30 to 7 30 again at Bayside restaurant May 26th our next wake up Newport meeting is May 2nd I'm scrambling a little bit to get a speaker but I'm sure we're going to have a good one and that will be at the uh, main library over in Fashion Island and for any uh, information on the chamber, please uh, go to our website at uh, newportbeach.com and you can uh, find out about all those events as well as um, see a video of uh, this uh, presentation. So thank you again, have a great um, rest of your week. Hope, hopefully I'll see some of you tonight at the mayor's reception. So take care, bye-bye.